Okay, great. Uh, so I heard yesterday someone uh, mentioning to someone else that all the lawyers have spoken and uh, nobody has done a talk about uh, jurisprudence and the law. And I'm here now to burst that bubble because uh, on this last day we're going to get into uh, the intricacies of law and uh, this wouldn't be a libertarian seminar without someone uh, to uh, go on a long uh, monologue about, about law and constitutionalism. Uh, so. Uh, this is going to be about expropriation of outcompensation. Gail wasn't lying uh, when she put that on the program, although I did add uh, expropriation of outcompensation and constitutionalism, so there is a little bit more to it. Uh, so, yeah, my talk will not be specifically about expropri expropriation of outcompensation, uh, which has been on everyone's lips. Uh, but more about uh, constitutionalist doctrine that may stand in the way of expropriation of health compensation or any other way uh, that government wants to violate our, our liberty uh, by amending the constitution. So the bulk of my talk will be about jurisprudence and not property rights. Uh, so it may be useful to just uh, remind you where we're currently at. So as you all know, the ANC in December of last year resolved to adopt expropriation of health compensation at its elective conference. Uh, Parliament then followed suit in February of this year by uh, establishing the Constitutional Review Committee to uh, uh, determine whether it would be necessary to amend the Constitution to bring about this, uh, this policy, and if so, how. Uh, and as recently as August, President Ramaphosa said that the ANC is committed to expropriation of health compensation. And what we're doing now is we're waiting for the Constitutional Review Committee to come back to us and tell us uh, what their plan is. Since this is a libertarian seminar, I don't think it would be wise to, uh, to uh, go about my talk without saying a few words about uh, libertarianism and constitutionalism. So many of you uh, would describe yourselves as anarchists and uh, you reject the notion of the constitution and perhaps even constitutionalism. Uh, many of you would have heard of Lysander Spooner. Uh, for example, he said that uh, because the US, US constitution either empowered government to be tyrannical or failed to stop it from being tyrannical, it was not fit uh, to exist in the first place. Uh, uh, but there are also monarchists in South Africa who reject specifically our constitution uh, because they believe uh, not only does it not protect our rights, uh, but it actually goes uh, against our, uh, undermines liberty itself. Um, but we are stuck with the constitution. Uh, the constitution, whether we think it's ideal or not, uh, is the highest law of the land. And uh, many of us have, do have great ideas about Cape secession and uh, individual secession and uh, that's, that's all great, and as a libertarian, I obviously uh, support that. Uh, and a few of us have uh, realized the idea of becoming a bit more independent of the state. But for the most part, we are and we will remain for the foreseeable future uh, under the thumb of the South African government. Um, and for this reason, we should make the most of the tools that are at our available and at our disposal. Uh, so unless anyone is advocating a violent, violent revolution to stop uh, expropriation without compensation, which I would uh, advise against, uh, the constitution must be libertarianized as far as possible. Uh, I did add, add a little asterisk there. Um, so yeah, whether we are agorists or not, uh, that means uh, living completely independently of the state. Uh, if, if expropriation without compensation passes, uh, uh, property rights in South Africa will obviously be undermined to a significant extent. Uh, so just to get back of libertarians having to take ownership of the Constitution, uh, the example I always use is of the United States, uh, where political factions vie for ownership of their Constitution. Uh, so progressives have their idea of loving constitutionalism, the conservatives talk about originalism, and even libertarians and objectivists also say that the Constitution represents their worldview. And all of these factions do have varying degrees of success. Uh, in South Africa, classical liberals, with a few exceptions like the Free Market Foundation, where I'm pr very privileged to work, and the Institute of Race Relations, have mostly ceded the ground of constitutional uh, interpretation and construction to the left. Um, even classical liberal inclined academics, of which there are very few, but they do in the, indeed still exist in South Africa, do not really engage in this enterprise of interpretation anymore. Uh, so advocates, attorneys, and lawyers generally, even when not representing their clients in court, uh, they defer entirely to the leftist interpretation of the constitution. Uh, 
So to propose, exa for example, to an advocate that the right to housing in, in the Bill of Rights should be interpreted as a negative right, i.e. that the government should not get in your way to provi provide for your own housing, uh, would only elicit chuckles and references to the Constitutional Court's case law, uh, which would uh, blow that idea compl completely out of the water. Uh, so my question is, why is it that American jurists and lawyers can acknowledge the authority of the Supreme Court, uh, Supreme Court case law, but also at the same time scientifically point out why the co Supreme Court was wrong. But in South Africa, uh, the notion of the Constitutional Court being wrong is almost inconceivable, inconceivable to us. Uh, so I don't know the answer uh, to that. So um, as far as uh, libertarianizing the Constitution goes, I would say we shouldn't be jurisprud jurisprudentially dishonest in the process because there are already well-established constitutional principles and doctrines that uh, would, can be employed in improving the interpretation of the Constitution in favor of individual liberty. Um, so yeah, I would say it must, the, the complete deference to the left's interpretation of the Constitution should probably stop, uh, and libertarians should take the, the South African Constitution and make it our own, uh, especially uh, in the media at seminars like this and in the law journals. Um, yeah. Uh, <coughs> Great. So uh, I mentioned that libertarian lawyers tend to defer to the leftist interpretation of the Constitution. Um, but even among lawyers and uh, judges and legal scholars generally, whether they're libertarians or not, uh, there is what I would consider to be quite a childish and impoverished way of going about constitutional interpretation. Uh, so the courts, uh, if they don't have a shortcut of blindly referring to clear precedent uh, in the case before them, look only at the text of the Constitution and build their judgments on that. Uh, even in the law journals, uh, academics tend to only take provisions of the Constitution and tie that with precedent. Uh, it is very rare for academics and judges to truly engage with uh, constitutional concepts and doctrines that permeate the idea of constitutionalism, but are not necessarily mentioned in the Constitution uh, explicitly. Um, so let's carry on here. Uh, yeah, uh, the Constitution is read in a, in a vacuum as if uh, in the mid-1990s it simply fell out of thin air. Uh, it does not exist in a conceptual vacuum, and it does definitely a, a, a disservice to constitutional discourse, especially for libertarians, because we are completely absent from it at this stage. Uh, since many, uh, as I mentioned, of the ideas in constitutionalism are specifically built around defending individual liberty. Um, so yeah, my view is that we cannot discuss expropriation uh, without compensation as a country, uh, so not just as libertarians, without engaging with these doctrines. Uh, so the constitution did not materialize out of thin air. It came about during a, a period in time when there was a global movement towards constitutionalism, for example, in the former Soviet bloc, uh, and so forth. Uh, it shouldn't be seen in a vacuum. Um, yeah, so what is constitutionalism and what is a constitution? Uh, so I have several definitions here, and the first is by uh, Timothy Sandefur, uh, his definition in the Cato Institute's Encyclopedia of Libertarianism. Um, yeah, there it is. So constitutionalism is the effort to impose a higher level order on the actions of government so that officials are not the judges of the limits of their own authority. Just as law is a limitation on action, a constitution limits the government's actions and is therefore a law for laws. In the absence of a constitution, a state's ruling power is ultimately arbitrary and its decisions are matters of the degree, decree rather than of well-settled and generally understood principles. Now, you may think that it's a bit self-serving for me to use a definition from the Encyclopedia of Libertarianism uh, as a source for constitutionalism, but uh, this idea, I would say, is not exclusively libertarian at all. Um, this is a definition from uh, Professor Ben Roo, who uh, wrote in 1971 in a textbook on South African government, uh, hardly a libertarian. Uh, constitutionalism is some form of top-level structural and functional differentiation in government aimed at limiting the possibility on the whole spectrum of government powers and functions being organically centralized in such a way that the reciprocal controls cannot be maintained in the process of rulemaking, rule application, and rule adjudication. I wish he used more punctuation, but other than that, it's still uh, 
a, a good definition of constitutionalism. And finally, we have Will Waluccio in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, who says that constitutionalism is the idea that government can and should be legally limited in its powers and that its authority or legitimacy depends on its observing of these limitations. So that's hardly a libertarian uh, definition of constitutionalism, but it still conveys the same idea. Uh, so, what do you, can we deduce or deduct from these uh, definitions of, of uh, constitutionalism? And uh, I would list uh, these. Limited government, the separation of powers, and the rule of law. Uh, and all of these features do have sub-features. Uh, a sub-feature of the rule of law, for instance, if any of you have read some of my articles, is that legislation shouldn't assign lawmaking powers to the executive or that uh, the executive shouldn't have the power to determine cases before it completely arbitrary, arbitrarily without reference to any uh, criteria in the legislation. So that's just uh, expansion on, on the rule of law as a government of legal principles and not arbitrariness. But for our purposes here, we need to ask whether property rights is a sub-feature of constitutionalism. And uh, there is certainly no uh, res uh, consensus on this topic, as you might imagine. Um, unlike with freedom of expression, uh, which is now characterized as an in integral part of, uh, of constitutionalism. Uh, if you cannot criticize government or ideas that government has, how can constitutionalism itself be protected? So uh, for constitutionalism to not be self-defeating, uh, freedom of expression is certainly a part of, of that. But uh, property rights. So this guy here is my master supervisor. That's Professor Kuis Malan at uh, University of Pretoria. And this, uh, I took these quotes from uh, Tsaka Licha, which form, it's formerly known as Afri uh submission on expropriation, which he contributed to. And this is what he would say about property rights and constitutionalism. Constitutionalism is founded on the basis of the disperse, dispersal of power among the largest possible number of centers of power. More specifically, not only the three centers of state power, but the widest range of loci of private, civil, and economic power. These loci of power must be strong enough to counterbalance governmental power and strong enough to counterbalance each other, thus to ensure that no locus of power grows so strong that it gains absolute power that would allow it to abuse its power <coughs> to the detriment of any segment of the populace. Since any locus of power, and specifically the state, is so strong that it can act in an unconstrained fashion, it becomes absolutist. That rings the death knell of constitutionalism. Institutions of civil society constitute loci of power capable of discharging their check and balance function only when they have their own property, which allows them to act autonomously. So he is saying that besides the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary, which are supposed to check each other in the uh, constitutionalist paradigm, he would include uh, civil society as, as part of that uh, uh, thing. And he continues saying, private property, uh, property rights serve as the guarantee for the autonomy of people. An individual man of straw without property, without the ability of affording a living, and who has to look at to someone else in, uh, in the eye to survive, also does not have freedom of their own views, or at least does not have the freedom to openly express their own views. Such person is for all practical purposes devoid of their citizenship and degraded to the status of a reliant subject and dependent customer of state handouts. Such powerlessness, reliant subject and needy customer can only hope that the state would be willing and be able to meet their basic needs through the allocation of state-sponsored char charities in the form of social grants. Um, so to summarize what I think uh, Malan is saying, is that without property rights, citizens cannot be dignified uh, or significant actors as intended in a constitutional democracy. Uh, everything we ha uh, have and do will in some way be dependent on government's favor. Uh, we all lack autonomy in every important respect. So he also argues that without secure property rights, civil society, which fun functions as a part of the system of checks and balances inherent in constitutionalism, will be emasculated. Uh, for example, if the Libertarian Society uh, and the Wilderness Hotel had to request permission from the Commissar on Political act Activism to hold this seminar, can it truly be said that uh, uh, civil society is functioning as intended? Um, I also submit that property rights are necessary for the realization of various other rights in the Constitution, uh, like the right to dignity, life, housing, health care, cultural rights, uh, freedom of expression, privacy, education, and so forth. The list goes on. Uh, so without property rights, it becomes far more difficult, if not impossible, for anyone to exercise their other rights in the Constitution. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, so, what are the implications of the nature of constitutionalism? Uh, for to me, uh, at least, and see, you're free to disagree with me, uh, it's an idea wholly dedicated to limitation. Uh, when we talk of a constitution, it's necessarily implied that whatever is being constituted can only act within that constitution. Even human beings uh, cannot go beyond our own constitutions. We cannot grow an extra arm or a leg or a head uh, for the most part. Uh, <laughs> a constitution defines the limits of something's ability and reach. Uh, so be to, to be dedicated to the idea to be a constitutionalist means to favor limitation uh, as opposed to facilitation and empowerment. Uh, this is not to say that the Constitution does not have provisions that empower this government. We all know this to be true at, the, at, at this po point, uh, welfare and so forth. But it does mean that any ambiguity or vagueness must be interpreted uh, and construed in a way that limits, uh, not empowers. So um, this is the enterprise of law, after all, is one of interpretation and uh, construction. Um, so every provision of a constitution must eventually be interpreted because its meaning is never self-evident. Um, and, and I would argue that the way to interpret that is always with this paradigm of limitation in mind. Uh, and one can call this uh, interpretation in favorum libertatis, uh, which is the Latin term, which means to interpret something in favor of the liberty of legal <coughs> subjects. Um, so this idea of in favorum libertatis was often employed by the courts during the apartheid era. Uh, to interpret mostly security legislation uh, with, with ambiguous and vague provisions in favor of defendants. So whenever there was any kind of vagueness in, in, in uh, the power, the court said, uh, no, the, this person must be let free. We're not going to uh, uh, allow them to be imprisoned on some vague provision. Uh, so in light of the parliamentary sovereignty that we had, as opposed to constitutional uh, uh, supremacy, this is one of the small ways in which the court could limit the, uh, the tyranny of the apartheid regime. Uh, unfortunately, nowadays you don't hear much about uh, in favor, uh, interpretation in favorum libertatis anymore. Um, so what's replaced in favorum libertatis mostly in South Africa is so-called purposive interpretation, uh, which is the new fad in South Africa. So this means that the court would look at the purpose of the provision and uh, interpret it in such a way as to achieve that purpose. And on the face of it, this seems quite reasonable. Um, but as John Kane Berman, uh, who recently wrote a paper for Afri Forum, uh, showed the constitutional court has been reading the idea of transformationism, or as Professor Chris Malan would call it, but transformation basically into every nook and cranny of the constitution. So uh, for example, with property rights, the court would say that section 25 is dedicated to transformation and uh, freedom of expression is dedicated to transformation and wherever you go it's transformation uh, which obviously th that cannot hold uh, the purpose for example of property rights is simply to protect your own private property um, so this idea of purposive interpretation has been perverted by the constitutional court among many other things that that court has uh, perverted unfortunately uh, so Introducing the basic structure doctrine. Uh, uh, I have now focused on mostly the idea of constitutionalism uh, broadly, but uh, let's focus it down to this uh, constitutionalist doctrine that may actually serve us in our quest to have a campaign or a challenge against expropriation without compensation. And that is known as the basic structure doctrine, uh, or what uh, Yaniv Rosny calls foundational structuralism. Uh, in his doctoral thesis on un unconstitutional constitutional amendments. Um, so this doctrine is associated mostly with the jurisprudence of the Indian Supreme Court, um, where it originated in case law in the 1960s. But it does have earlier intellectual history, uh, early American legislators, French intellectuals, and the German, unfortunately, is today remembered for his support of the Nazis. Carl Schmitt uh, provided some uh, some intellectual uh, grounding for, for the basic structure doctrine. Uh, but it was mostly another uh, German professor uh, known as Dietrich Conrad, which had the biggest impact in South Africa. Um, he delivered a lecture in, I believe, the 1960s uh, at an Indian university titled um, The Implied Limitations of the Amending Power. Uh, and the paper that this lecture was based on was given to the, the lawyer who would go on to represent one of the petitioners in the first case that adopted the basic structure doctrine. Uh, and the doctrine has been adopted uh, in other countries such as uh, Uganda, Peru, and Bangladesh. Um, great, so it's important to note the context. Uh, oops. 
uh, because it's it's so close where where this doctrine came about because it's so close to our current context. Um, so much like we're currently experiencing, the Indian government wanted to pursue a land reform policy uh, soon after it uh, gained independence to break down their caste system. Um, and to do this, it proposed amendments to their constitution, which was challenged in court by landowners. Um, so the earliest cases in the Supreme Court failed, uh, as the court followed what is probably the conventional wisdom amongst <coughs> most people, and that is that an amendment to a constitution, which complies with all the formal requirements in the constitution, cannot itself be unconstitutional, because it's part of the constitution now. That is the, the conventional wisdom which the basic structure doctrine uh, challenges. Uh, the first case uh, in which this came about was Golakna versus Punjab in 1967, uh, in which the court held that Parliament's uh, power to amend the constitution could not be used to abridge fundamental rights. And uh, of course, this ignited the turf war between uh, the government and the court, uh, with the Parliament passing um, other amendments that would basically emasculate the Supreme Court and give the legislature unlimited amendment powers. Uh, but these amendments still were rejected by the court in the case of Kerala in 1973, uh, when the court held that the amendment power does not include the power to alter the basic structure of the constitution so as to change its identity. Uh, and since then, the, the basic structure doctrine has been uh, repeatedly affirmed by the Indian Supreme Court uh, in the cases of uh, Indira Nebru Gandhi versus Raj. Nahari, Narain, uh, in 1975, and in Minerva Mills versus Union of India in 1980. Uh, and after this last case, uh, Minerva Mills, uh, the doctrine has become completely entrenched in Indian jurisprudence. Uh, so uh, since that case, uh, these have been the features that have been adopted as part of the so-called basic structure of the Indian constitution. Uh, liberal democracy, constitutional supremacy, uh, the rule of law, separation of powers, judicial review, freedom and dignity of the individual, unity and integrity of the nation, free and fair elections, federalism and secular secularism. Uh, so to summarize what the basic structure doctrine uh, means and says, uh, it basically says that a while constitution may, and all constitutions do, prescribe a way uh, for it to be amended or changed, there are certain features that are inherent in the fabric of constitutionalism or in the fabric of that specific constitution that uh, cannot be amended. Uh, so uh, parliaments around the world are only empowered to amend but not abolish the constitution. And this is the, the, uh, the essence of the doctrine because when you take away a foundational feature of a constitution, you change its identity. And at least in South Africa, parliament is not empowered to do that at all. Um, so Rosny uh, notes um, correctly that if the amendment power is unlimited, which the, do the doctrine of uh, basic structure argues cannot happen, the line between constitution making on the one hand, uh, which is reserved for uh, the people, and constitution amending, which is a role for parliament, uh, would be dissolved. There would be no distinction between these things anymore. Um, so therefore, in terms of the basic structure doctrine, uh, certain constitutional amendments can themselves be unconstitutional, and therefore a court can invalidate them. Uh, and here Rosny uh, just summarizes his own uh, theory. This theory proposes to read a country's constitution in, the found, in a foundational structuralist way, according to which each, each constitution has to be regarded as a structure in which all of its provisions are related. But structuralism itself is not enough. This structure is built upon certain pillars, foundations that fills its essence, hence foundational structuralism. Accordingly, the focus is not merely on the constitution's procedures, but also on its substance. Substantively, a constitutional change may be deemed unconstitutional, even if accepted according to the prescribed constitutional procedures, if it conflicts with unamendable constitutional provisions, or collapses the entire order and its basic principles and replaces them with new ones, thereby changing its identity. Um, great, so let's move on to the South African constitution. Uh, so the important question is whether, besides whether the basic structure doctrine applies per se in South Africa, is what the basic structure of the South African constitution is. Um, uh, so of course every constitution will have a different basic structure, uh, although there is a, a high degree of, of overlap. Um, for example, in South Africa, we cannot say that the basic structure of our constitution includes federalism, that would be absurd. 
And also, unfortunately, something like uh, the right to have a firearm is definitely, I would argue, not part of our, uh, our constitution's basic structure. Uh, but the rule of law, for example, would be a foundational aspect of any constitution in the world, I, I would argue. Um, so the founding provisions in chapter one, and especially section one of the constitution, are certainly a guide to determine what the, uh, the basic structure of the constitution is. Uh, so various uh, values like equality, non-racialism, haha, uh, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law, constitutional supremacy, and dignity are all listed there. Um, but the founding provisions are not exhaustive. So for example, it doesn't mention judicial review or parliamentary as opposed to executive democracy, uh, both of which I would say are probably part of the constitution's basic structure. Um, so unfortunately, we don't have time to get into uh, what the whole basic structure of the constitution is, but mostly whether property rights are, are part of it. Um, so yeah, the next step is to ask whether uh, there has been any recognition of this doctrine in, in our jurisprudence. Uh, so, in this uh, 1995 case of the Executive Council of the Western Cape Legislature versus the President of the Republic of South Africa, uh, Justice Albie Sachs said the following, uh, there are certain fundamental features of parliamentary democracy which are not spelled out in the Constitution, but which are inherent in its very nature, design and purpose. Thus, the question has arisen in other countries as to whether there are certain features of the constitutional order so foundational that even if Parliament followed the necessary amendment procedures, it could not change them. I doubt very much if Parliament could abolish itself. Uh, yeah, that's a good example. Uh, even if it followed all the, all the framework principles mentioned above. Nor, to mention another extreme case, could it give itself eternal life, uh, the constant renewal of its mem membership is fundamental to the whole democratic constitutional order. Similarly, it could neither declare a perpetual holiday nor give a far less extreme example, could in my view shuffle off the basic legislative responsibilities entrusted to it by the Constitution. <laughs> so he makes a good example. Uh, if Parliament uh, proposes to abolish its, uh, its own self in the Constitution by amending it, uh, Sachs would argue that it would probably go against the basic structure of the, the South African Constitution. Uh, then there's the case of uh, Premier of KwaZulu-Natal versus the President of the Republic of South Africa, which was a year later, 1996, where uh, Deputy President of the Constitutional Court, Ishmael Mohammed, said, it may perhaps be that a purported amendment to the Constitution following the formal procedures prescribed by the Constitution, but ra radically and fundamentally restructuring and reorganizing the fundamental premises of the Constitution might not qualify as an amendment at all. Um, and in the case, the 2002 case of United Democratic Movement uh, of South Africa versus the pre President of the Republic of South Africa, uh, it was assumed, uh, the basic structure thing was assumed uh, with, regard, um, with reference to the two prior cases. Uh, so they didn't uh, say anything new there. Uh, so in all these cases, um, in all these cases, the Constitutional Court did not actually answer the question uh, whether the doctrine applies in South Africa, as the court usually does, because it's, uh, it wasn't a strictly relevant question to the, to the facts before it. Uh, so as the lawyers in the room all know, although I see there's only two, uh, the rest have left, which is unfortunate. Uh, <laughs> Uh, a court would not answer an important constitutional question if it can avoid it. They call this constitutional avoidance uh, because uh, it doesn't want to assume that it needs to solve all problems in the first case that comes before it. Um, so it's an open question whether the basic structure doctrine does apply in South Africa. Uh, but all we know currently is that the door is open for it to be put to the constitutional court or any other court at this stage. Uh, so the Constitution itself, uh, let me just play around here. The Constitution itself uh, provides some, uh, in, an implicit endorsement, I would say, of the doctrine in section uh, 167.4d, where it says that the Constitutional Court may decide on the constitutionality of any amendment to the Constitution. So usually a provision can be framed in a qualified or an unqualified way. Uh, this provision is completely unqualified. It says that whatever amendment comes forward, the Constitutional Court may decide on its constitutionality. It does not, for example, say that the Constitutional Court may decide on the constitutionality of any amendment to the Constitution in terms of Section uh, 75, which is the provision that provides for the amendment of the Constitution. So this is completely unqualified, and in my view, that that could be used as a, 
as an authority for for adopting the, the doctrine in South Africa. Uh, okay, so now, yeah, the important question is property rights and the basic structure doctrine, uh, since we're interested in protecting property rights in South Africa. Um, so yeah, none of what I've said so far matters for expropriation without compensation uh, if property rights or more specifically the right to compensation if property is expropriated <laughs> is not seen to be part of the basic structure of the constitution of South Africa. So uh, we need to ask, are property rights or is property rights part of the, uh, the basic structure? And I simply don't know. Uh, it's too big a question for, for me. <laughs> uh, and I can't say for sure whether it's part of the uh, constitution's ba basic structure. Uh, I would definitely like it to be uh, since I'm quite a fan of property rights, as you may know. Uh, but I also like, for example, gun rights, firearm rights, and I know that an honest argument cannot be made for the idea that uh, we have a right to bear arms, as the Americans do. Um, so as we saw, Quiz Malan, my uh, master supervisor, would say that property rights is ingrained in the, it's embedded in the notion of constitutionalism itself. And if this argument is to be accepted, then it may go a long way in locating property rights within our constitution's basic structure. But I would say there are other considerations as well. Um, so for example, uh, property rights are quite important to the, uh, the negotiated settlement that transitioned South Africa out of apartheid. Um, so it might even be said that uh, if property rights were not in, uh, guaranteed in the constitution, there would be no constitution per se at all. Uh, in fact, the Free Market Foundation had to argue before the Constitutional Court in 1996 that the first draft of the, the, the so-called final constitution was inconsistent with what was agreed upon at the Godessa negotiations um, uh, because it didn't go nearly far enough in, in entrenching and protecting property rights in the constitution. So because of what the FMF did, uh, we do have Section 25 of the constitution today in its current form. Uh, but property rights are also implied in other parts of the Constitution, uh, which may also uh, imply that property rights per se are part of the basic structure of the Constitution. Not yeah. Five. Five, okay. Uh, so for example, the right to privacy, which says everyone has the right not, not to have their property uh, searched. Uh, section 205, which uh, regulates the police service, says that it's the duty of the police to protect and secure property rights. Um, uh, yeah, so the duty of the police is to uh, secure uh, people and property. Uh, and uh, a section we definitely, as libertarians, won't like sections 228 and 229 of the Constitution, which mentions property rights and taxes. Uh, but without property rights, uh, how would that make sense? So maybe uh, it is part of the basic structure of the Constitution. Uh, so uh, just a few concluding slides. So I would say that there is at least a... Uh, an argument to be made here. There's a seed of an argument that property rights are part of the basic structure of the constitution. And secondly, that doctrine does in fact apply in South Africa, which is, would be my argument. Um, but whether we will be able to use this argument would depend heavily on the text of the eventual amendment, uh, which we're still waiting for. The, I don't know what's keeping the uh, parliamentary review committee. It's taking forever, uh, keeping us all in suspense. Um, but whether, yeah, uh, so if the amendment is a sham, which many of us are hoping it would be, that it's just a complete uh, water, uh, watery thing that doesn't really do change anything, then I don't think we can use the basic structure doctrine. The court will probably laugh it out of court. Um, but if the amendment represents a significant attack on property rights, uh, I would say it's probably worth a try as an imperative uh, to just try whatever we can. Um, Here's a quote from the late Richard Pipes, Harvard University. I think he wrote an article for the Hoover Institution and he said, my argument is that property rights are necessary, are a necessary if insufficient attribute of freedom and the rule of law. And that is, you can have tyranny with property, but you cannot have freedom and the rule of law without it. Um, yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, there's my website, my email if you have any questions. That was mostly aimed at the senior lawyers who were sitting in the back uh, yesterday, but they are now uh, gone with the wind, unfortunately. Uh, and keep an eye out for my upcoming book where this, uh, this argument is explored in a, a little bit more detail, uh, the Constitution and the Rule of Law, an introduction, which uh, Judge Rex von Skogweg is writing a foreword to, uh, which I'm quite uh, happy about. Thank you, I'll take your questions.
Thanks. Martin. Uh, yeah. Uh, France. France. Yeah. <laughs> Martin, do you, you distinguish between the rule of law and constitutionalism? That's the first question. You mm -hmm. can just confirm or confirm right. Okay. And then the second part of the question is uh, you haven't really examined them then on the basis of that whether the rule of law can be a foundation for attacking uh, an amendment to the property. Okay, so I, I did distinguish between the two. So I see the rule of law and constitutionalism as basically the same, uh, both two sides of the same coin. Uh, so the rule of law, I would say, is uh, more concerned with how the government conducts itself, uh, and constitutionalism is more concerned with what the the ability and the reach of government is as a, a, a framework way to kind of, the rule of law doesn't set a framework but so just says that if government is going to act how it must act so I, I do see a bit of a distinction there although when you look at definitions of the rule of law and constitutionalism they're more often than not basically exactly the same uh, on your second question so Robert Vivian who also sits with you on the rule of law advisory board at the free market foundation he made an argument that the rule of law as uh, a provision in section 1c of the Constitution, which says that uh, South Africa is founded upon the supremacy of the Constitution and the rule of law. Um, he made an argument that if we adopt expropriation without compensation, then uh, it would not only amend Section 25, which will take away the right to compensation, but would also, by implication, touch the rule of law, uh, which is in Section 1, and Section 1 requires 75% of the National Assembly rather than two-thirds of the National Assembly to be amended. So Robert Vivian's argument is that uh, that is an angle of attack where we can say to, to the Constitutional Court, listen, Parliament only had 66 point whatever, whatever else the ANC and the EFF have together to amend this, but they need more because this is a rule of law question, not just a property rights question. Um, I am convinced by that argument, although I don't think the Constitutional Court would be at all convinced by that argument. So I'm, I'm happy for us to, uh, if there's going to be a, a challenge from, for example, the FMF or any other civil society organization, I would say that would probably be something we should argue in the alternative. Uh, but I think it's a completely valid argument, yeah. Colin? Uh, so I, I like your example of the Minerva Mills, and it, it, it made me wonder whether uh, okay, it, my understanding was, I'm not a lawyer, yeah. my understanding was that Minerva Mills was one of the cases that established basic structure doctrine in India. Yeah. I, and it, I don't know if, it, it, if that might not have been a property rights uh, case at all, but if, if, it, if it established a, uh, a useful tool for the future, does it ever happen that people sort of make up cases to establish doctrine because it would be useful for another case? Uh, so in, I, I believe the Golak NAF case was the one that was on the issue of property rights. Uh, I'm not sure that the court ever agreed with the petitioners that uh, property rights were part of the basic structure. They did agree that there is a basic structure. So I don't know if the property rights argument ever succeeded. Um, but maybe just explain the second part of your question: whether people make up their make up cases. So it just seems like it like. Before the those three courses that yeah. those, those three cases that established the doctrine, mm -hmm. if there had been a, a different, more contentious issue for which the activist judges might have wanted, or, or the, the parliament, or whoever yeah. might have wanted to do something, and the the, the lack of that doctrine would have uh, would have been a problem. Having those three cases establish the doctrine. It has now since been helpful to mm. Indian jurisprudence, it's say. Yeah. Does it ever happen that people deliberately go and find three unrelated cases to put them before the court in order to establish a sneaky doctrine for a fourth case that's upcoming? Oh, I would, I would say, of course, yeah. Uh, so yeah. as lawyers, we always look for cases that confirm what we're trying to argue, and we, we, we don't ignore cases that don't, but we try and uh, draw the court's attention away from them. Uh, so yes, that definitely does happen, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Martin, what will happen, uh, apart from fact, anybody will laugh at you, if mm -hmm. I would challenge the, the government and says that uh, the rule of law, one of your laws is actually uh, violating the constitution, like tax laws, for example, mm -hmm. that you have to pay tax, what, what will happen? So the constitution does give government power of taxation, uh, so yeah, that, that will be a difficult one uh, to convince the court of, uh, because the constitution itself does say uh, the original constitution, so not an amendment, does say that taxation is within the legitimate uh, 
purview of, of government. So yeah, the, unfortunately, the court will definitely laugh that one out of court. But, but even with the basic structure doctrine, it's, the chances of its success are very, very low uh, because our, our current constitutional court bench, I wouldn't describe it as libertarian or libertarian inclined. Uh, there are a few characters on it that are very much big government statists. So they will want to avoid anything like what I just explained here, like the plague. Uh, but yeah, I think it's a, a better route than uh, to take up arms, uh, at least uh, as a start. Theresa? Martin. Sorry, Theresa. I'm sorry. You have raised the question of um, expropriation without compensation. Is there anything afoot which concerns expropriation with compensation? Uh, what do you mean? Uh, so the, the constitution well, does provide choice. One is to take land from people and pay them, yes. giving them no choice. Yeah. The other one is to take land and not pay them. Yeah, so the constitution does provide for expropriation with compensation. There can be no expropriation without compensation in South Africa currently. Uh, and government has been doing that. Uh, I think recently there was a case, uh, some game farm in Limpopo, I believe, where they uh, the guy wanted 200 million rand and they offered him 20 million rand. Uh, so there is compensation there, whether it's uh, just and equitable is, is an open question. Uh, but yeah, government has been, has been doing that. Uh, so, so it is current practice? Yes, yes, it's, it's, okay, it's current you. practice, yeah. Sorry, I, I'm, I mean, I know it's a great battle that you're fighting at the moment on this and, and waiting for this amendment um, to know what to do. <clears throat> but I was just wondering, um, you know, if much of, of what, especially what the Free Market Foundation does, you know, if this is the, you know, it's not maybe the only area where you are engaged. Yeah. However, if we're looking at the issue of hearts and minds, yeah. you know, a lot of your, um, um, the definition that you gave of constitutionality and property rights, you were saying that without property, people yeah. are kind of almost nothing yeah. before the law. They yeah. have no freedom. So. You know, in, in negotiations, I always say, put yourself in the other person's shoes. Yeah. And um, for a lot of South Africans, those are the shoes that they're walking in. Yeah. Was not having been able, not not owning property. Yeah. I know. I you know, I think the most exciting thing in all the years that I've been coming here was was Leon's point on you know, with the stroke of a pen, everybody yeah. in South Africa could become a property owner. Yes. And. Um, you know, this is not the stroke of the pain that we want. Mm, mm. <laughs> However, um, with the Kailan project that I think is doing so well, where people are getting title, my discussions there with, um, with Perry, and other, it seems that a lot of the problem with achieving something like this, which is another way of allowing people to have property, is that it's not, so, you know, it's not on, this, on the constitutional level, it's stuff buried mm. in bylaws and um, in municipal acts yeah. um, that are preventing the easy transfer of title. Yeah. So, um, you know, I probably should know more about what <laughs> you guys are doing at the FMF, yeah. but is there an equal focus on attacking those um, provisions and legislation or? Yeah, yeah. so. Uh, yeah. Uh, a big issue that we're faced with is uh, conflict of, of laws, uh, because we have one uh, law that was passed in 1991, which is called the Upgrading of Land Tenure, uh, yeah, Upgrading of Land Tenure Rights Act, ULTRA, uh, which basically says that if you live on council-owned land under certain specific circumstances as a lease, uh, a tenant, then your owner, you have been upgraded to an owner. Uh, that's the fact. It's not you have to be upgraded, you have been upgraded. So now all that needs to happen is it needs to be administered, you need to get the title deed, you need to do the process in the deeds office. Uh, but now Parliament has passed various other laws which seem to go against that and provide us sets in stone different procedures and so forth. So we have a little bit of confusion there, but we are engaged with, for example, the Surveyor General's office and so forth. To, and we have talked to the, 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 sent the chief registrar of deeds in Pretoria to just get some kind of declaration to say, listen, apply the Ultra Act to make it easier for people to get the title deeds to their property. Uh, it's, uh, it's a work in progress, uh, endless frustration. But yeah, we're definitely working on that. Um, I'm not a lawyer, as you know. Uh, I've got a, somewhat of an angle to put into discussion here. The 
the, uh, the definitions you showed were very legal yes. definitions. Mm -hmm. Now, I think this current thing that's happening now, the, the land uh, from, uh, without compensation thing, that has been effectively <coughs> voted in by an ANC party congress. Mm -hmm. And this is where the snag starts. I don't think there's any legal argument, so to speak, at this. Day. So I think it's a, it's a much wider spiritual thing now. Mm -hmm. But what actually happened was there was an ANC Congress and we were all highly emotional and they voted that this is what must happen and one of the things was land without compensation. So when the president stood up in his Sona speech, he had to effectively say, now that I'm president, I'm doing what the party has commanded me to do, which are the following, mm -hmm. one of which was that, which mm -hmm. he said. So now it's become an issue. And when you listen on the radio to phone in shows and things like that, people just phone and say, yeah, you know, this guy's been sitting on some land since the Fort Trekker days, why should he have it? We want some. So let's just vote it otherwise. And things like the, the Constitution being so fundamental, that doesn't really come into discussion. Mm. And that's the worrying thing. Now, just jumping slightly sideways, I've, I've been a fan of Michael Crichton books, and I, being a scientist, I would read these things and wonder how come he got the science so right, because nobody ever does. <coughs> Then I discovered after some time that he's actually a qualified medical doctor and he has had a degree in anthropology as well. He gave a superb speech at an American university, which was 1983, as I recall, and it's well worth it to look it up, about environmentalism. And he said it's turned into a religion. And he said that in anthropology, they teach them that everybody needs a religion. And they said, the religion doesn't have to be one of the standard religions and what's happened is that this greens has turned into religion you get atheists for example but they still want to believe in some greater good and so you've got mother earth as your thing and you've got to strive for the perfection of mother earth and all the principles that you find in a religion and so they get this religious fervor that they're pro wind and they're pro solar and they're anti nuclear because this is what mother earth wants and, and rationalism goes out of the window and that's the type of thing you're fighting um, just to is Another there a constitutionalism question in there? Yeah. <laughs> so what I'm saying is that this, this thing now, I don't think that there's over much debate about the reality, but what the danger is, is that it came about emotionally through the ANC Congress and other things being fought as to what people think about whether I can have some of your land. Mm. And the fact that this shouldn't be touched because the Constitution says it shouldn't, mm. there's something that's going to be missed of people using those terribly technical legal definitions. It's, I think it's going to be projected to the public in another way to say, look, there's something like a spiritual cloud up there, which is your constitution, mm -hmm. which is how society is supposed yeah. to work in an ideal state, and you shouldn't be fiddling with it. Yeah. You, you can't go to the constitutional court or go to parliament and get them to change the Ten Commandments, for example, by voting yeah. out number eight. Yeah. Um, that just wouldn't fly. Well. So no, it's beyond everybody. And now yeah. the land's yeah. constitution would be in the same place. Yeah, so uh, I think what you're alluding to is uh, what I think in America they call the American civic religion, which is basically... Uh, it's, it's a secular religion where the constitution is seen as some kind of lodestar in society and the constitution is almost holy. Uh, we definitely don't have that in South Africa. Uh, lots of policy discussions are had without even mentioning the constitution. Uh, in my daily uh, work at the FMF in public policy, the constitution rarely features, uh, and especially provisions like the rule of law. Uh, there is definitely, a, I would say, a constitutional immaturity in South Africa where um, and, and I mean, you have people like Jimmy Manye and so forth. So, uh, I think the ANC Women's League uh, head of, uh, said uh, about a year ago that this constitution thing is just getting in the way. We need to go back to uh, parliamentary sovereignty so that parliament can just do what it wants and uh, empower the people. So yeah, we, our society is, is struggling with this constitutionalism thing. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I can see the problem there. And, and we should definitely probably try and... Uh, create more of a, a respect and an admiration for the Constitution. And I think uh, Kaya Lam, the FMF's project, is to an extent doing that because these people get their title deeds and we tell them this will be yours and it, you're, when you wake up tomorrow morning it's still going to be yours because it's protected in law. Nobody can take it away from you. So, yeah, baby steps. But yeah, it's, it's definitely a problem. Yeah. Okay. Over time, so last three questions, two minutes each, both question and answer, please. Martin, Ron, me. Martin, uh, Constitution and Bill of Rights. Uh, I can't recall now because I, I'm more or less just lost uh, interest in the whole thing once I started talking about an entrenching group rights into the Constitution. Mm. But 
Is a bill of rights separate from the constitution, or does it, or uh, is it just subsumed in it, or do we have a separate bill of rights? No, so it's, it's one thing. The bill of rights is chapter two of the constitution, uh, uh, but it does have it's it's treated somewhat different. Uh, well. Yeah, not really. So it's mentioned in the amendment uh, provision, which says how much Parliament needs to amend the Bill of Rights. But for the Bill of Rights, it's exactly the same as the rest of the Constitution, which is two thirds of the uh, National Assembly and uh, five out of the nine provinces, I believe, uh, in, in the National Council of Provinces are needed to amend the Bill of Rights. The only thing in the Constitution that's treated as if it's separate is section, uh, section one. Yeah, it's section one, it's part of chapter one, which says what South Africa's founding values are, the rule of law, non-racialism. For that, Parliament needs 75%, but also, again, five provinces in the National Council. So our upper house is a completely useless institution, but uh, uh, so the founding provision, section one, is treated somewhat separately from the rest of the Constitution. But no, the Bill of Rights is completely subsumed in, into it, yeah. Uh, two questions. Is this a, just a damp script? Because be, in between seven and ten months from now, we'll have a national election and all sorts of things may change. And secondly, um, my pragmatic view is this might go, assuming it does, the way of mineral rights, mm. where effectively they'd be nationalised. Yeah. Um, mineral right holders, of which I'm one, they have a title deed, but the Constitutional Court held that that's valid, yet government is the custodian of those mineral rights and gives you whatever rights and uh, obligations and responsibilities toward them. So in effect, they own them. Is it not going that way where you'll keep your title deed, but government will tell you who may or may not live there, etc.? Yeah, so I think the Institute of Race Relations is basically saying what, what you just said. Uh, government has succeeded in the last two decades of watering down property rights, especially mineral rights, to such an extent that uh, the constitution is basically just a formality. Uh, they would change it and just formalize the process, but in effect they can already just take property as and when they want. I mean, there's an argument that a lot of legal academics are making that they think they're helping, but in fact, I think they're doing a, a big disservice. They're saying that you can already take property without compensation in terms of the constitution uh, because of some interesting reading of some of the provisions. And they're saying, so don't, don't amend the constitution, just take property without compensation anyway. So yeah, I, I, I take your point. I think that it may, it, it may go that way. Although in the mineral rights case, the chief justice, the, probably the only good thing he said in that whole thing was, I'm not setting a general principle. This is only for this case before me. In different cases, it might go completely differently. But th despite the fact that he said that, he, he did set a principle and a precedent. So uh, yeah, that, that's a big concern. I, I would agree, yeah. Could I tap into your knowledge of constitutionalism, mm. which is you gave a list of about between 10 and 15 characteristics of a good constitution. Mm. Um, too many for me to remember. <laughs> Is there, could you narrow that down to just one or two, maybe three characteristics that are fundamental to almost all constitutions? Oh, so yeah, so um, the long list I had was the basic structure of the Indian constitution, uh, but then earlier I mentioned what I consider to be the three basic features of constitutionalism and any constitution. It's limited government, uh, con uh, yeah, it's limited government, the separation of powers, and then there was another one. Let me just fly back to it. I, I'm thinking it's constitutional supremacy, but I may be wrong. Uh, yes, yes, rule of law. It's limited government, rule of law, and separation of powers. Yeah. With all due respect and no further conversation, but that's yeah. a lawyer's answer. All three of those require a lawyer. I'm a lawyer. <laughs> You're going to get a lawyer's answer. <laughs> I'm kind of looking for an, an individual's answer. Uh, liberty, property, uh, Life. <laughs> uh, Kido, thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, everyone.